Hi guys, morning, how are we doing? And welcome uh, to Christ Community. I'm so glad that you are here with us today on December 26th, uh, which, uh, how many of you are, are new to the area in the last, let's say, year? Just by show of hands, quick show of hands, new to the area in the last year. All right, you know, 80%. Okay, good. So, um, welcome. I am from North Carolina, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the longer I live here, the more I find and I'm told by others that that's a rarity and we're a real gym. And if you're from North Carolina, praise God for, yeah, that's right. It's the best state, you guys. It is the best state. There's no better state than North Carolina. If you know anything about me, you know that North Carolina is the best state. I will fight. I will get like a fist fight with you about, uh, you know, North Carolina. Sorry, Pastor Ronnie, about the whole love message here. Okay, anyway. Okay, so that said, there is one qualm. If there's one bone to pick with all of North Carolina, this is what it is. I will give you this. The internet will give you this. And today, outside, as you... Exit, you will experience this, that on December 26th, we have found ourselves in the middle of what is known as Fool's Spring. It's 76 degrees outside today, you know? Yeah. Some people love it. After that, you've got second winter, then spring of deception, third winter, followed by the pollening, and you've seen this and know the deal. And, and, and the thing about the weather in North Carolina is that it... While it was like ice cold a week ago, and it, we were getting promised winter. Do you know what I mean? We were getting promised it. And it was so cold. I, mean, it, I felt like it might snow on Christmas this year. And now today, like you go outside and get a suntan. Rob McCord is going to get a suntan today. I know it. And, um, and today, but this, was just one of, this is where we're at. The, the, the winter that we were promised is hollow. Like, the, the thing that we were so looking forward to, if you're a winter person, I'm a cold weather guy, it's not, it's not really, it's not the real thing here. And, and, and what, we, what we'd hoped for, well, it's just not really the purest form of it. And... John, in our text today, as we close out our series on Advent, we'll be in 1 John chapter 4. You can go in your Bibles there now if you like. John, in, in chapter 4 of 1 John, is really concerned with the real thing. What, he, what he's after in the life of Christians is the real thing. Mary J. Blige says it this way in her famed 1992 Real love, she says, real love, I'm searching for a real love, someone to set my heart free. Real love, I'm searching for a real love. I've got to have a real love. And we're not all that different today. We're still searching for a real love. And what John shows us in 1 John chapter 4 is not the lower thing, not the hollow thing, not the fake love, not the loose love, not the half love that we see today, but, but a real love. And I, I want to go there in our text, and we'll go there, uh, and we'll just spend a few minutes together today. And I know that we have some young guys and gals in the room, and so we just expect all the rustling and the, and the noise and all. Don't worry, we love kids here. We love kids at Christ Community. We're glad that you're here. We want you to come here and experience the Word of God together. And so we'll be together for a short time, and then we'll roll out from here. But let's go to the Word of God now. And John writes in chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 John, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you for 
the love that you show to us, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us so that we might have life. And Lord, we pray today, God, that you would show us real love. Help us to see what you've done for us in the cross. Help us to become like you in your death and burial and resurrection and among one another. And Father, we pray that you would speak now. In Jesus' name, amen. A quick main point for you to do, it's a very simple point, and the point is this, that God's love is like no other, so God's children love one another. God's love is like no other, and so God's children love one another. And the first thing that we see in 1 John is that uh, God is the source of divine love. Like when you read, and I know that he writes everything that he writes as just a little like a, a, a riddle, you know, and so uh, it's like all these little if-then statements. But, but if you were to pierce through all of it, it's a very simple message. And the message is, is that God is the source of love. That love comes from God. Uh, and so if, when you go home today and uh, you want to get some ice out of your refrigerator, you go to the refrigerator and you get the ice or you get the water out of your refrigerator. If you don't have a refrigerator that does that, you know, the sink, whatever. Anyway, you, you get the point. And, and, and um, we, we can get that water there, but we know that that's not really the source of the thing. And, and, and love is like that. We can see all of these sort of lesser and smaller versions and depictions of, of love, but, but we know that it's not really the real deal. It's not really the source of the thing. You see, the source is that spring, you know what I'm talking about? Like it comes from a mountain and you get down the mountain and it's all there and it's all ice cold and you see it rushing. I mean, that's the source of the thing. And, and, and it's, it's, powerful and it's vast and, and, and it's so different than the dribble that comes out of your sink, right? God's, God is the source of love. He says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. Now, the kind of love that John's talking about here is a, a totally different quality of love than what we see uh, in so much of our life and so many of our relationships, what you see in uh, the movies or on TV. The kind of love that John's talking about here is an agape love. That word in the Greek there is, uh, is this self-giving. Imagine free of self love. Unconcerned with me, love. A love that is others first, others focused, regardless of what I get, regardless of the, no terms and conditions, love. This is the kind of love that John's talking about here when he says love. He's, he's talking about a totally different variety of love. And I don't have to tell you that when we talk in our common vernacular about love, uh, you know that it's different to love a burrito than it is to love your firstborn child, right? Like, I don't have to tell you uh, that those two things are, are different. There's a quality of love, a distinction of love here that all throughout the text John is concerned with. He's concerned with this agape love. And uh, you see in 1 John 3, 1, he says that, uh, that uh, with Look, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called his children. It's a, it's a higher quality of love. It's a distinct kind of love. All throughout the Psalms, I'm, I'm amazed with how many Psalms, uh, when God describes himself, he describes himself with a steadfast love, a, a committed love, an enduring love. Romans 8, 37 and 39 and say, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's an enduring love, a vast love. Paul made it his prayer for the church in Ephesus that they would have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God. And it's a self-giving love, Jesus says in John 10, 18, that no one takes his life from him, but that he lays it down freely of his own accord. The, 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 the bigness of the love of God and the richness of the love of God and the joy of the love of God that is set on you is totally different than the love that we see here and now in this lower, lesser, contaminated form. God's love for you is different than anything else you could ever know. Amen. And man, I'm telling you, like, that has the power to change your life. You, if you're looking for something to be different in 2022, look to the love of God. If you, if you are, are looking for life change, look to the love of God. Like, that's the thing that can change your life. 
It's, it's not just the, the source of God defines himself. He says, uh, and it's very rare that you see God define himself. He describes himself with all these different attributes, but he defines himself here in this text. He says, God is love, which means that it's uh, not just a thing that he does, but all that he does is defined by love. There's nothing that God does. There's no activity or operation that happens uh, in all of his uh, being that is not love and that does not come from love. And, and so uh, because love is such an abstract idea, though, God gives us this picture. And, and because people are visual, primarily, I think, uh, he, God gives us this picture. He says, if you want to know what love really looks like, look to the cross. Look to the cross. Look, look at what he says in uh, verses 8 and 9. He says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Uh, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, Love is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for sins. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, this time of year, like there are all these lawn ornaments out there. And you know what I'm talking about when I say lawn ornaments? You know, you've, been, you've been in neighborhoods, right? My neighbors across the street have, you know, the, there's like a snowman, you know, and uh, the wind <laughs> up through the thing. And, uh, you know, but, but before that, it doesn't do anything. You know, it just sits there, it just looks like, you know, like trash in your yard. Uh, but then at nighttime, you know, it comes up through the thing. And wind, of course, is totally invisible. It's, it's not, you, you can't walk outside and see wind. Uh, but when you put the up through the, the, the thing, what you get is a snowman. And it's incredible. And love is like that. The love of God is like that. That, that we, you can't just see it. But when you put it up through the container... What you get is a picture, a representation of who God is and what he's like and what his heart is toward you. Even while we were sinners, God loves. And he puts his love in the container, the person, the flesh of Jesus. And he comes to this earth and he lives among us. And when he lives among us, he treats us well. Those people who were far from him and unlike him and undeserving, he says, Come and eat with me. Come and be my friend. He says to those people who it was unthinkable for the world around them to accept them, he invites them and draws them in. He says to the thief on the cross who hated and persecuted him, he says to that man, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because by faith that brother believed. In the container of Jesus Christ we see the love of God. He comes and God puts on flesh and lives a perfect life. And dies then in our place for our sins. And this is what John means when he says that Jesus has come and died as a propitiation for sins. Sin, I was talking to a guy this week, and uh, he was, he's, he is still, uh, but he is a Jew. He is not interested in becoming a Christian, but we're having a conversation around Christianity. I was trying to share the gospel with him, and, but we were back and forth, and uh, and, and I'd asked him at one point what he, what he made of sort of sin and the doctrines of sin and that kind of thing. And he found the whole thing very offensive, the idea of total depravity. And if you don't know what total depravity is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it here in a moment. But he, but he basically said, I just don't think that people are by, by nature bad, that people are, are, are by nature sinful. Uh, you know, I don't think they're good either. I'm not even sure if they're really neutral. They're just, it's just this gray area kind of thing. And the whole thing was sort of offensive to him. And, and we were back and forth on it. And, and, but I didn't want to bruise the, the, the fruit. We were having a great conversation. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, I wanted to be courageous and, and give him the, the truth of Scripture. That's the one thing that I can give him that's of really any value. And, and so I said, you know, I hear what you're saying and I get that. And I, I just paused for a second because I was trying to think of how to address it. And I, and I said, you know, I think, and we'd been talking about just hurt in the world and hurt that he'd experienced in his life and all the rest, and you know what that's like. And I said to him, I, I think that people are sick and that we are sick with badness and that when I'm sick, I cough. And he looked at me and he said, I, I agree with that. And I said to him, that's the doctrine of total depravity. That we are born sick under the curse of sin. And because we're sick, we act like it. And we choose to sin. We say wrong things. We do wrong things. 
we act against God, and we suffer, and we create suffering. And what Jesus does in his love for us, even while we were sinners, is that he comes and dies for us. This is what John means by propitiation. Some people would translate that as expiation. The idea is really uh, more than propitiation, it's actually atonement. Expiation is when uh, God clears the board, gets all the wrath off the table, says, okay, we're cool. Uh, That's expiation. Propitiation is when God says, but now come into my family. Receive favor. Not, not, just that we're, not just that we're fine, but actually that I'm going to set my favor on you. And this is what atonement is. This is what Jesus does. Is he's, he dies for the penalty of our sin and then invites us into his family by his love. That we may have life. John 10, 10, he says, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. If you hear anything today, hear this. God loves you. Wherever you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what kind of hurt you're in, God loves you. And that love is personal. He sees you. He knows you. He wants you. The best of you and the worst of you, he loves you. So much that he gives you the picture of love in the cross and says, come to me. Be in my family. I've come and died for you. And then he invites those of us who have become his children. Uh, A, God's love is like no other. He invites us then to love one another. God's love is like no other. So God's children are then freed up to love one another. This is what uh, John says that, that those who uh, are, are, are love are born of God and, and know God. Born of God is the idea of being spiritually born again. You see this in John 3. Jesus says that you must be born again by the Spirit, not just by the flesh, but by the Spirit. That you raise a new life. And then that, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, you see this idea that we're ambassadors for Christ, that we are born of God and that we, so that we uh, look like God and we act like God. I have a little girl and she's phenomenal. And she, uh, when she was born, man, she looks just like me. Like she's inherited all of the genetic code that I have to give. And, uh, and so she, her little face looks like my face. Her expressions are like my expressions. So cute. And uh, she's the best. Anyway, and, uh, and so, but, but now she's the older she gets. That's nature, you know what I mean? But now the older she gets is nurture. It's all nurture now. And so she says the funniest stuff. She's just, I mean, like, you, you I can't even tell it to you. We don't have time. But it's, she's hilarious. It's great. And, uh, and so, but ever so often, uh, my, what, some, she'll say something. Some, something will come out of her mouth that's so, uh, it is so precise that it could only ever be attributed to me. And my wife will look at me, and, and, I, and I, I think she's concerned, but she'll just look at me and she'll say, that child is your child. Do you know what I mean? You, you, your parents have looked at you and said that, you know, you're, you, you, you'll never believe what your son did today, you know, your daughter did today, uh, that kind of thing. And, and so um, she looks like me, and she acts like me. Children of God look like God, and they act like God. And God says that the, the, the chief expression of his children is love. The way that you know that you're his is by the fact that you love. Look at verse 11. Beloved, if... God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. God's children love one another because their father is love. And so John then gives the imperative. It's not a suggestion. I mean, he's, he is commanding Christians We ought to love each other. We ought to love each other. You guys, the church should not look like a cage match. Like, it's, we have a problem whenever the, like, the the ideology of inclusion in the modern era looks more like love than the church. We have an issue whenever uh, the, the, the wait staff 
at the restaurant that you go to after this service may think more of the world around us who is in chaos and brokenness and devastation than Christians because of the way that we treat one another. Jesus says in John 13 that by their love, they'll know, the world will know that they're my disciples. He says, a new command I give to you, love one another. I don't know who it is for you. I don't know who it is for you in your community group, in student ministry, who it is for you as you're serving. I don't know who it is for you. And this is a church command. This is a family meeting that we would love each other. But friend, I would encourage you, the highest way is love. And one of the greatest adversaries you will have in this Christian life as you pursue loving others will not be giving someone, uh, will not be laying your life down for that person. I heard someone say this earlier, talking about a family uh, meeting that they were going to be a part of, and they said, you know, of this person... I, I know that they would give me their kidney if I needed it, but I just don't think they care about my feelings. And it's a familiar sentiment. I, the greatest enemies that you will have as it pertains to love will, will not be these massive, I'll take a bullet for you kind of things. It will be, inse- it will be inconvenience as you are walking through the island target and you, the person in front of you is walking like one of those sloths, you know, from the DMV in Zootopia. <laughs> My gracious, I'm telling, I literally had this, I'm so far from where I want to be on this. But in all honesty, what John says is that God's children love one another. And it is so important that we see this. Look at, uh, back at verse eight, anyone who does not love does not know God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. And this statement is of vast importance to you and to me. If you want to know what you really believe, do not ask yourself what your best intentions are. Don't say, I really wanted to love that person, but if you want to know what your heart is really like, Don't go, I was going to care, but look at the fruit of your life and ask the question, what were my actions? Did I actually love that person? Did I actually agape that person? It's free of self, sacrifice. Forgive. Slow down and stop caring so much about my to do list that I treat people like they are products and discard them when they feel consumable and too difficult to deal with. If we don't have love, we don't have God. Friend, if you don't have love, I. I This is, let me just get behind the text. If you don't have love, you don't have God. Regardless of intention. You you may have said, I've prayed prayed a prayer, right? You know, I walked an aisle. Listen, if, if the love of God, a love like no other, has not changed you, you don't have it. And this is, I promise you this is not meant to be harsh. This is grace. And the grace of God for us is either that the fruit of our life will demonstrate that we are actually his and we by that fruit gain assurance that even though we're not who we want to be and where we want to be yet, we gain assurance that God's love is in us, that he abides in us and will make us into who he means to make us into. And yet, if we don't have 
that love. It's still grace because, God, here in this moment for you, right here, right now, in Mass Required or online or wherever you are, God is revealing to you, you don't have love. You don't have fruit that is associated with the gospel. And so he's saying to you, you may not be a follower of Jesus at all, regardless of the experience that you say that you have. If nothing has ever changed, then you today need to actually, for the first time, turn from your sin and trust Christ. And he would lavish his love on you and adopt you into his family and forgive you of your sin and heal your sickness that has come from badness and make you into something new and alive and free. This is the offer and the promise of the gospel. And man, it can be yours. You don't have to wait. You don't have to earn it. The love of God is free of condition. But he says that the way that you come into relationship with him is by turning from your sin and, for, and trusting in Christ. That by faith we believe and trust and know God. And we become born again as children. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you, do you know God? Do you know God? Has, has the love of God come to you in such a way that you have become one who loves? I know the holidays are a difficult time to have this conversation because people are hard, because life is hard, because we have unmet expectations. Maybe today you know you're in Christ, you know you're a follower of Jesus, but Lord, you say, I'm missing the mark on this. Do what John says in Revelation to a church who's very much like this, strengthen what remains. right here in your heart, right now. Just, God, help me to strengthen what remains. Those opportunities are gone. Those days are gone. But Lord, I want to be someone who loves like you love. And you say, I'm not sure that I have this kind of love. I thought I did. I had this experience. I prayed this prayer. But my life, if I'm really honest, it doesn't look anything like Jesus. Do what Paul says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right now, right here in this place, you could ask God, Lord, would you forgive me? God, I want to know a love like this, a love that changes everything. God, would you heal me of my sin? Maybe you say, I know that I'm not a Christian but I'm searching for a love like this. Right now, God would give it to you. I wanna invite you right now, if you are not a follower of Jesus, if you're wondering, Lord, what would you have me do in this moment? God's inviting you to join his family. He's inviting you to know him. He's inviting you into a love like no other. One that won't let you down one that's not hollow, one that delivers on its promises. He's inviting you to a love that would forgive you of your sin and secure your eternity. And right now you can have that. If you would, right where you are, say, God, would you forgive me of my sin? You can have my whole life and commit your way to following Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Father, we pray that you would be honored as we go out from here. In Jesus' name.